Welcome to Fort Knox Update. I'm John Fort. Uh, I'll say back with Byron Winthrop, one of the first CEOs who I spoke with in the Fort Knox series, and here with Stephen Kuritz, the author of American Flannel. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the piece, Stephen, that you wrote for the New York Times uh, about Byron, an American giant, and uh, that's that's become a book. So uh, b- because you're on Fort Knox for the first time, I'll start with you. Tell me about why you saw this as an important story to fill out. Uh, well, I met I met Byron in uh, twenty late twenty seventeen as he was starting to gear up to make uh, a flannel shirt uh, in America, and uh, flannel hadn't been made in America since the nineteen nineties. Uh, I was really surprised by that, um, as I think Byron and, and other people were as well. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, flannel is such a foundational American garment. And, you know, given the backdrop of the industry, uh, this is an industry where, you know, it almost went entirely offshore between 1980 and now, um, you know, domestic apparel and textiles has really been decimated. And I thought it was a really interesting business challenge. Um, You know, how do you operate in this industry when so much capacity and, and expertise is gone? And I wanted to follow Bayard on that journey as he had to literally reconstruct the supply chain for flannel for flannel in America, every part of it. Uh, and he wasn't sure he was going to be able to pull it off. And I thought it was really interesting and uh, really gutsy on his part um, to take that challenge on. And the book kind of follows his journey and, and other journeys, um, you know, to make things here, to make clothing here in America. This intersects with a lot of things because I was in Arizona earlier this week, a couple of days ago with Intel and President Biden as they were announcing uh, the CHIPS Act grant that they're gonna get to build more chips in the US, trying to reshore that business. Intel's been continuing to do chips here, but it's it's difficult to build important things in the US right now. So Bayer, talk about American Giant for a moment for people who aren't familiar. I got I bought my flannel, I got it in the mail last week. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I've, I've gotten a few things from American Giant. So not, not only is your stuff made in America, it's made from textiles grown in America. That's really ambitious. Yeah, well, first of all, John, thanks for the support. It, it, uh, it, it means a lot. So I appreciate you, you supporting the brand. So the, the really quick uh, history of the company is uh, I started in 2011. I'd spent most of my career after leaving uh, corporate finance in um, manufacturing and most of that time uh, offshoring jobs. And, and uh, I'd reached a point of kind of this progressive process of always moving um, the production of the things that I was selling overseas and disconnecting from the humans and the communities that were making those things. That began to bat- bother me, both at a personal level, but also more broadly as an American, it began to make me feel like, boys, we're undermining some pretty fundamental tenets of keeping a, a functioning uh, country alive and well. Um, and, and also this sort of awful feeling of becoming disconnected from the product that I was making. And so American Giant really began as an idea of saying, I'm going to make as highest quality American made clothing as I can from the cotton all the way through to the finished product. And I'm going to trust the fact that that quality and those values are going to resonate with with Americans. I didn't know if we'd be a big or small business at that time, but I knew it was a business that I'd be proud to run. Um, but your you know your your analogy of the Chips Act it's such an important one, right? And and those types of efforts, in my judgment anyway, begin to rebuild the fabric of the country and begin to provide good jobs for communities across the country. We can't all be working in the high tech industry. We've got to have jobs across the economic sector, sector across the skills sector. And so I think textiles, you know, in some ways, textiles is the toughest business to, to keep um, domestic and not offshore. And that was part of what drew me to the challenge is that it was a difficult one, um, yet an important one to serve as an example. And so American Giant has been, you know, a, a, a real passion and, and, and mission based business for me as much as a, as a as a financial endeavor. And so it's been a it's been an interesting last few years. And the flannel was Stephen got to get a front row seat at at one of the more difficult challenges that we've tackled over the years and, and got to be really along for every aspect of that ride, which which comes through in the book. Your your financials aren't public because you're not a public company. So tell me how how big is American Giant at this point? You started off kind of with the hoodie uh, at least that's what popularized American Giant. And what are the trade-offs that you have to make? Because the what you what you sell isn't cheap. Yeah, in the beginning, the business was tiny, and we made a single product, a men's sweatshirt, and that that was the sweatshirt that was called the greatest uh, hoodie ever made, and that kind of built the company without 
without that article and that initial product, we wouldn't be here. Today, the business is a lot different. It's men's and women's, tops and bottoms, wovens and knits. We've got retail stores across the country. It's a much larger business today, much more complicated business, but the essential um, structure remains the same, which is we invest a ton in, in our product and try to put really great quality product into the market. To your second point about the price, um, it, our stuff is more expensive. And, and I would just say, you know, this is obviously an important conversation. We all may land in different places about it, but but I think it's appropriately expensive in that by making things in America, you make things within the construct of American values. They, they comply when we manufacture in America, we comply with human rights standards, with environmental standards, with worker safety standards, with OSHA standards. And those things make it harder and more expensive to make things. That's a good thing, I would say, because it reflects Americans' values. That's that's why those laws exist. I think it's a bad thing when we let our largest brands, and this is particularly true in apparel and textiles, our largest brands benefit financially, have their shareholders benefit by exploiting uh, not having to comply with those standards that Americans support by offshoring to places that, that avoid those things. And so we feel it's important. Uh, I know many customers may, may not, many investors may not, um, but I think it's a super important discussion for us as Americans to be having because making sure that we've got good and vibrant jobs in communities that are in inner cities and in rural America is a big part of how I think we get back to a place where we're bringing a nonpartisan view to how we restabilize the country and get it growing and getting it optimistic again. And Stephen, this uh, book isn't just about American giants. So tell me where Bayard's story fits into the overall economic picture that you got a chance to paint here. Yeah, you know, so there's this startling statistic that uh, in 1980, around 70% of the clothing that Americans wore was made in America. And now that figures around 2%. Um, so in, in a span of, you know, 40 years, we basically sent all that whole industry or most of it um, offshore. We don't even really make blue jeans here anymore, although American Giant does make blue jeans, but most, most companies don't make blue jeans here anymore. And so, you know, I wanted to look at the people who were left, that 2%. You know, I looked at them as survivors and I, I wanted to understand who had survived that offshoring process, how they'd survived, who was stubborn or idealistic enough to come into the industry now, you know, like Bayer did and try to do this. And the book is really about people. It's about these rare, unusual, resilient manufacturers and makers who still make clothing here. Bayard and American Giant, they're one main pillar of the book. Uh, another is a woman named Gina Locklear. Her family um, had a sock mill growing up, um, and she's from this town in Alabama called Fort Payne. It was once the sock capital of the world uh, into the early 2000s. Uh, one in every eight pairs of socks, tube socks were made there. Um, and, you know, in her late 20s, she decided to go back to Fort Payne at a time when the majority of the mills had closed down. China had become the new sock capital. And she went back and reinvented her family's business by making organic fashion socks. Um, another uh, brand I talk about in the book uh, run by a father and son in Maine called Rancourt & Co. They're one of the last people in America to make hand sewn shoes. They make these really beautiful shoes. They also make shoes for other companies like Ralph Lauren. Um, you know, these are people who, and I have to say, you know, and this goes for Bayard too, the conversations that I had with these people, you know, oftentimes in fashion, it's about trend. It's about marketing. The conversations I had with Gina and Bayard and, and the folks at Rancourt, they were entirely about quality and how can we make you know, better products. And, and, and the focus is entirely about the quality of that product, about the factory they're supporting, the workers they're supporting, the community. Um, and I was really struck by that uh, in reporting the book. And there are other characters in the book as well that sort of, um, you know, have held on. Um, they're all really interesting, interesting people. Um, and they're doing, they're doing it the hard way. I mean, the easy way is to send it offshore and you know, higher, high, you know, cheap labor and you pocket the difference. Um, it's hard to make a flannel shirt in America as Bayard um, and I both discovered, you know, in the, pro in the process of reporting the book. And Bayard, part of this is uh, certainly out of necessity, right? If you're going to make something in the U.S., it's going to cost you more. You're going to have to price it higher. And so it's going to have to be about sustainability, not disposability, 
right? It's going to have to be something that you keep around for a while. So what kind of consumer mindset shift does that necessitate unless you're just selling to the very richest? Yeah. And, and before I answer that, I just I was I was smiling uh, during Stephen's answer because he's managed to write this great kind of rollicking business book that is, you know, whether it's textiles or any other, you know, enormous business challenge where there's an underdog fighting against a larger industry, it just has this, he just did a great job kind of weaving this complicated, exciting uh, uh, story that is just, uh, there's a lot of universal truths there about business in general that I think he really got right. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think it's already happening, John. I, you know, the, I think consumers intuitively understand that that we've had this sort of um, this decline over the last 40 years in quality. I know I certainly have. I got young kids and I'm always struck by the amount of things that I buy and they're sort of instantly falling apart or the denim I buy that kind of is instantly kind of degrading at the knees or whatever it might be. And so we have this intuitive sense, all of us as consumers. I think the question that that, that is that is in front of the country and all of us as consumers is, is how much are you willing to pay for a set of values or a set of quality? And that's our job. I think, you know, our, 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 and, and, and Gina Locklears and, and rank what shoes. And our, our job is to, is to, is to make the pitch that, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was just at a, at a, at my brother's wedding, um, last weekend. And I put on a pair of shoes that I bought for my first job in finance when I was an intern at age 17. I still have those shoes. And they're still the shoes I wear for weddings. They're beautiful. I paid a lot for them when I got my first job. I bought a suit and I bought a pair of shoes. And I remember buying them being like, oh, my Lord. But I still have them. However old I am now, 35 years later. That's a that's an important paradigm, I think, that quality paradigm. And supporting values, hopefully, along the way that you care about. And, and our particular take on that may not you know, resonate with a lot of consumers. It resonates with some. Um, but we really feel like we got to compete on great, great quality that transits into value and hopefully transits into the flannel shirt that you have that you're wearing at 10 years from now and thinking about how soft it's become and how textured and whether it's become and it was worth that higher price than you paid for the one that maybe you got at a at a fast fashion retailer that only lasts you, you know, nine months and, and ends up in a, in a recycling bin or at the local Goodwill. So, Bayer, tell me about policy and I mean, it's an election year, how that fits into the picture. What are the major policy issues, decisions, perhaps laws that you think need to be passed to support this effort that you've been pushing on now for more than a decade? Yeah, well, so I think, you know, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, whether you're a Trump supporter or Biden supporter, I think both those candidates and and both the administrations that that are that will sit underneath either one of them, I think, are really thinking about this issue a lot. And and a strange thing, one of the, the, the rare areas where both both Trump and Biden seem to align is on their uh, their trade policy postures, um, whether it was Bob Lighthizer under Trump or Ambassador Tai under Biden, they both very much believe in this in the premise of putting production at, at more in the center of our uh, of our foreign policy or trade policy. The, the Chips Act is a great example of that. Um, I think one question is to what extent will either of those candidates take the rhetoric and put it into action? And I think it's we're seeing some good movement in the Biden administration. It's really encouraging on that front. Um, so, so that's the, that's maybe the, the, the landscape that we're in specifically, there's a lot of problems with trade policy, specifically as it relates to places like China, where I think many of your listeners, viewers may know about what's going on in Xinjiang, where there's lots of human rights abuses happening over there. And, and yet still that stuff seems to be getting through all types of loopholes. Um, so closing those loopholes and beginning to, to rebalance, um, our, uh, our domestic policies with our trade policies, I think, is at the core of it. I spoke to that earlier just to say that if we are going to hold our domestic manufacturers to standards, as we should, we should also hold our foreign policy, our, our foreign trading partners to similar standards so that we are supporting a rural or an urban uh, economic engine and not just allowing our largest brands to make a ton of money by chasing cheap wherever it's going to take them and around every uh, regulation that they can get around. So there are some obvious ones like de minimis. I don't want to get overly te technical with your audience, but there's a really clear one about de minimis that allows anything under $800 coming in from overseas into the domestic market, duty-free and essentially inspection-free. That could be closed with a signature. It's one of the most illogical trade loopholes sitting out there. Um, it's the one that um, our industry is really focused on. Most consumer products are. And it's really up against some of the biggest lobbyists trying to keep it open. Um, the big shippers and and groups like Amazon that are doing everything in their power to keep that loophole open and getting that closed would be a big deal. So th that, that's one. Uh, there's a lot of them, but um, but there's a, there's tons of opportunity to begin to create a more level playing field. One final thing. I'm betting on American workers 
every time, John, if it's if they're provided an opportunity to fight on a on a level playing field, my money's on them every time. And uh, and this whole you know Stevens book proves that point. It's just you, you give people a chance and they they rise. The book is American Flannel, uh, and one of the main characters in it is Bayard Winthrop. Bayard, Stephen, thanks for joining me on Fort Knox. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us.